Joe, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about your Praxis success story. I remember personally working with you in the program, so I'm really excited to chat with you today about where you are and just the big journey that you've been on over the past year <laughs> and a half of your life. Um, you want to kick us off by saying kind of, you know, what your two-minute Praxis story is and what you're doing today. Yeah, so I was a music major jazz performance and music ed major at the University of Michigan. I was there for a year and a half and I dropped out to become a priest. Uh, I spent another year visiting a bunch of monasteries and living with monks and also taking classes at community college. And then I decided I didn't want to be a priest anymore. And I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. So I was just sort of taking those classes at community college. Uh, at this time in my life, I was really interested in education uh, education policy, like what's the best way to educate people. And I was on a website called the Alliance for Self-Directed Education. And I saw an article written, and I, I don't remember her name, and I feel really bad about this, but it was written by somebody who, she was like, oh, I'm on location in Cairo studying my fourth language. And I had this cool job and I did this cool thing. And she attributed it to this program called Praxis. And I was like, I want to get in on that. That sounds cool. And also, I have no, nothing going on, so I might as well apply. So I applied, and I got in, and I'm pretty sure I set a record for fastest, fastest acceptance of uh, the offer letter, which I don't know if whoever told me that was joking or not, but it was really fast. Anyway, um, so I got in. I actually had a year before I started, so I, exemplifying the fact that I had no idea what I was doing with my life, I went to work in a national park for six months, which was a lot of fun. Then when I got back, I started working at, I had two jobs at a funeral home and at a hospice center. And that's what I was doing when I was at Praxis or when I was in Praxis. Um, I was in from January, 2019. I got my apprenticeship at Marginal Revolution University, which is an online economics education website in July of 2019. I was hired on as the marketing associate and I am still there, still doing marketing things and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a really great recap. Um, okay, so I want to unpack this a lot. Let's start from studying music theory in college at, in Michigan. Yeah. What made you choose that? Was it a strong decision? How old were you and what was just like the mindset at that time? Yeah, so I was always musically talented as a kid. I played piano, I played the saxophone, I played the clarinet, I played the flute. So it was only natural for me to go to music school. Uh, and I, I say that deliberately because I didn't really know if I wanted to go to music school, but I was sort of, I was so good at it. Everybody was like, oh, of course Joe's going to go study music and he's going to get into a good school like Michigan and he's going to go study music and that's, that's the way it's going to be. I, I, it was actually... I don't know if I said I was studying music education and performance. So I was doing a double major. Um, and then I, I got there and I thought to myself, I don't really know if I want to be here, but it's a great opportunity. So I'm going to give it my best shot. And turns out I did not really want to be there at all. Um, and then, yeah, so, so the decision wasn't, wasn't entirely mine. And I don't, I don't mean to, malign others when I say that, but it was just sort of like, I'm on this path and I'm going to follow it. And this is where I'm going to end up. But I think a lot of people can probably relate to that, like societal mm -hmm. pressure, family pressure, friend pressure, just identity pressure of feeling like you're expected to do something. So you go out and do that thing. Is that kind yep, of what that, it That's exactly what it was. It was just a lot of, and it was a lot, it was pressure from my, my family. And to be clear, none of this was negative pressure. It was just assumed that I'm going to go do this. And it was everyone from my friends to my teachers, to my family, to me. I, even I was like, I should probably, I should probably do this. It was almost out of a sense of obligation um, that I was doing it. Hmm. And besides just not feeling that alignment there anymore, what else was it about the education experience that you just weren't clicking with? Particularly at music school, it's a very weird mix of, well, it's like, so most college courses or most normal majors are, I take four to five classes a semester. Uh, I have a couple of days off maybe, and I have homework to do. Music school is 
you're taking nine classes every semester because every class is worth one to two credits. I had a two a class that met for like six hours a week. We were learning new instruments, brand new instruments, and it was two credits. So it was like, that's a lot of stuff to do. Plus, um, the, the thing with music school is you're taking all these classes, but you also have to practice for two to three hours every single day. So it was either you devote your entire life to this one thing, which for me was going to be the saxophone, um, or you just don't do it at all. And so th there, was, it, it, there was not a lot of room to like, hey, maybe I'll, I'll take um, this literature class or maybe I'll take this philosophy class. No, you are doing nine music classes and maybe an education class every semester until like your junior or senior year when you can finally start exploring. So it's a very rigid, very um, rigorous in like a bad way where you're just drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling and there's not a lot of room to experiment. Mm, yeah, and I can definitely see how that kind of like zaps the passion and the original love for the music. Yep, totally. Yeah. So then that happened. <laughs> what sparked the the next interest or next move in your career or life to then move into studying priesthood and then eventually stopping that? And <laughs> um, so that was so, so I'd been trending in that direction for a while. When I was in high school, I was thinking about it. And that's sort of why I had reservations about going to music school, because I was wondering, well, maybe I should join a seminary or do something. Um, so when I left, it was kind of like, okay, I'm done with that. Now I'm going to do this. Since I have, I have no obligations to anybody or anything at this point, I've completely blown up <laughs> what everybody thought I was going to do. So now I'm going to do this thing that I think I do want to do, which is go... Um, and discern the priesthood, as we say. So I decided to do that, and I started emailing monasteries, which still exist for people who aren't aware. There are monks, and they are in the United States. They might be near you. And I spent time in those monasteries, living with them, sort of learning their way of life, getting up at 3 a.m. with them and going to bed at 7.30, all that good stuff. Um... And that lasted about a year and a half. I, I actually ended up spending a month on in, uh, the Rosebud Indian Reservation, which was really rewarding. I had a week-long silent retreat. And at the end of all these experiences, which is why they call it discernment, I was like, I don't think this is for me. But I'm really grateful that I had the opportunity to sort of explore this outside of the obligations of you have to do this or you're not going to be successful. You have to like follow this prescribed path. And I was like, well, I already, I'm off the path. The path, the path is no more. So I'm going to take this time. And, and at this point I wasn't really planning on not going back to school. Um, it was more like, I'm just going to take a break and see where it leads. And that's where it led. So I'll stop at that part of the story and you can ask your next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you mentioned that during this, you were also balancing some community college classes. Is that right? Yes, because I was still, I, I wasn't taking a full schedule, but I was still like, I feel like I should continue my education. Um, I can at least use the credits if I decide to go back. And I, I, to be clear, I wasn't doing this for the entirety of the time. When I got to the end, like near the end of my discernment process, I wasn't doing it anymore because it was just interfering. Like I couldn't take classes and spend a month on a reservation, um, for example. So it was kind of like almost like a safety net for yep. if it didn't work out, you had something to fall back on. Yeah. Okay. And so then when you kind of left that process and experience and you hit the realization that it wasn't for you, what was going on in your mind? Were you feeling really calm about your next life career move or were you kind of like, I have no idea what's next for me? Well, that's the nice thing is my approach to when I don't know what's coming is to say, hey, this will be fun. I wonder what's going to happen. Um, so I don't have the anxiety around that, which, which I think is a good thing in most cases, but sometimes it's a bad thing because you can tend not to make plans, which maybe you need to make. Um, so, so in the interim between doing the, the finishing my discernment process and beginning praxis, I got a job at a grocery store and was just working. I really didn't know what I was doing. I was like trying to figure it out um 
And that's when I just happened upon that article that introduced me to Praxis. But it wasn't like I was looking for anything. I was just sort of, I wasn't treading water. I was exploring my options, but I wasn't on the college bandwagon anymore. Like I wasn't taking classes anymore. I was sort of adrift and it didn't bother me, but it was just an odd time in my life because I knew I didn't want to go to college. I knew I didn't want to be a musician. I knew I didn't want to be a priest, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was just sort of exploring my options and that's how Praxis came about. Mm. And so when you came across Praxis and kind of that very chance happening, what was the immediate attraction to it? Like what was your initial understanding of what it was and how it could serve you? Uh, it's not college. That, <laughs> that, was, that was the first thing. I was like, wow, you're telling me I could get a real job and I don't have to go to college. This is great because I had so many problems with the education system. And like I told you about my personal experience in the music education system, but I had so many problems with, you know, the cost, the, 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 the relative benefit that you get, like all these, all these different things. Um, anyway, so I saw it and I'm like, it's not college. That was the first main attraction. And then I was like, this doesn't seem real. It seems too good to be true. So I did a bunch of investigating online I read a bunch of people talking about it and I was like, well, it seems to be legitimate. And the Praxis back then, I don't know if they still do, but in 2018 or whatever, there was, there, there were a bunch of stats on the site, like 97% of our people graduate and then keep their job or like they're making this much money or whatever. Um, and I was like, well, I don't think they would lie about all of that. So I decided to give it a try just because I was like, why not? I have nothing else going on and this has me really excited. So I should try it out. And that's where it all started. <laughs> I love that. Um, so you did a little bit more research, which I think is really common. And that whole reaction of this seems way too good to be true is definitely something we yep. hear a lot. Um, what was the application process like for you? I know you said that somebody on the team mentioned that you were one of the fastest acceptances. I don't know. I can't fact check that for you. <laughs> I mean, it was almost immediate. I got the, cause I was so excited during the application process and I don't remember everything that I had to do, but there was like, I remember there was this one, we had to write some article as part, like about anything. They just wanted to see your writing skills. And before I submitted it, I sent it to Isaac Morehouse because I was like, I, I, had, I had communicated, I had emailed with him before just saying, hey, this is really exciting. I just want to let you know how thrilled I am that, and I stole that technique from his Forward Tilt podcast where he's like, hey, just make yourself known and be nice and stuff. Um, so I, I had already emailed him and I was like, hey, I'm about to apply to Praxis. Um, would you mind taking a look at this for me? And he basically was like, this sucks. And I was like, thank you. That is the first time anyone's ever said that to me about something I've written. So I completely redid it. And that was a really like formative experience for me when I was, when, when I got that sort of feedback that I'd been looking for, like, hey, this actually isn't very good. And I'm not going to tell you it is because I want you to succeed, not someone telling me, oh yeah, you're on the right track, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't, I don't want that. So that was a really, that was the highlight of the application process, I think. But then, it, you know, there was the interview. Um, I think there was a second interview. I think there was a video interview and then there was a second interview. But anyway, um, it was relatively long. And when I found out I was in, obviously I was thrilled. And unfortunately I couldn't start for a long time because I had already committed to go work at the national park and the internet there was so bad that I couldn't load Gmail most of the time. So I couldn't exactly be on a weekly Zoom call, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I actually did not know that about your application story. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Went right to the top. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So fast forward into the program, um, I guess in that year leading up to practice, did you kind of do any work to prepare for your entry into the program or were you just waiting for your start date? Um, I was mostly just waiting because I was at the, again, I will say it again. I was at the park. There was no internet. Oh, you know what? That's completely untrue. I forgot. I did the daily blogging when I was at the park. So I 
blogged pretty much every day for the whole summer. Um, just about, you know, whatever, what I saw that day or what I was thinking about, because I really liked the advice that Isaac and TK would give in office hours and in forward tilt the podcast, which was basically like, just write, you know, just write and get stuff out there. And actually to jump ahead a little bit, that's the main reason that I was hired at MRU because they saw all of my writing and they were really impressed. And they're like, well, this guy doesn't have that much experience. Um, but wow, he can really write and he's really dedicated to it. So we want to give him a try. And apparently they liked me enough to keep me. So <laughs> Um, that is, that, that, that's probably the biggest thing. Uh, I mean, it's one of the biggest things I got out of the program is that portfolio of writing that I just have. So if I'm applying to some, like I just applied for some writing fellowship a few weeks ago, it's like, provide a sample of your writing. It's like, okay, which one of these 300 pieces of writing would you like to read? Because I have that many that are just sitting there. And eventually once things calm down a little bit, I will start my blog up again. Um, Anyway, I got really off topic. I'm sorry. No, let's, so let's talk about that. So one of the modules in the program is the writing module. You're stepping into this program that's nothing like any education experience you've gone through before. What was your experience in the program, working with advisors, going through these very like unconventional education modules? Yeah, just all in all, how did you feel when you stepped into the program and you went through all that? Well, it was sort of... Um... I don't, scary is too strong a word, but it was certainly sort of a nerve wracking experience because I was so used to the structure of school and the rigidity and like, you're going to do this at this time. And if you don't, you're in big trouble. And Praxis was not really like that. It was like, you have a week to do something every week. We're going to do something else. Um, a good example of this was my uh what what was it called oh the hire me video where you had to make a pitch video and the instructions were like you know they sort of laid out a prescription and uh, for like how the video should be like it should have this and it should have this and it should have this but i remember and i was like i should make a video like that and then i remembered that praxis you know it's all about break the mold and do something different so i was like okay well my ho I'm going to try ignoring all of that and just sort of do my own thing. And I was nervous because I'm like, what if they don't like it? What if it's, you know, I didn't really follow instructions when I have to redo it, but I was confident. And this, this is sort of a strength of the program and the people within it where I was confident enough to sort of shed those learned structures of school that told me don't deviate from the instructions or you're gonna you're not gonna pass the standardized test or you're not gonna get an A on the project. So I deviated from the instructions because of the environment that Praxis fostered and it was like I think you guys still use it as an example if I'm not mistaken. But it was a lot of fun. It was like really unique, I think, and and pretty funny. I still have it on my website even though I'm not looking for a job because I think it's just a good <laughs> skill showcase. I'll have to link it in the in the description for the video. I'll find it. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, so definitely practice is about breaking the mold, you know, not subscribing and kind of, like you said, shedding the barriers of the school mindset. What else were some of the bigger lessons that you learned in the program or maybe even realizations you had about yourself as you went through that? I think the, the biggest thing that I lacked in the program was organizational and time management skills that's not really something that's taught in school. You can sort of paper over it if you're smart enough and you can be like, oh, well, I forgot to do this, but I'll do it really well and I'll turn it in or I'll do it the same day and I'll turn it in and I'll get an A or a B or whatever and who cares. Uh, with Praxis, it was very obvious if you didn't spend time on something. It was very obvious if you didn't put in the amount of work that you were expected to. And again, it's not like the people, the advisors or anything were like, oh, you, bad job, you didn't, you didn't get it done on time and now we're going to take a grade away. It's more like the consequence is that you have something poor to put in your portfolio when you're trying to get a job. And that is a completely different, like that's a paradigm shift from school where it's like, I am in, in the immediate future, I need to do this or else I'm going to have an immediate consequence where this is like, I need to do this for a long-term benefit that is way more expansive than an A or a B. It's like, this is what I'm going to show to my potential employer to prove that I'm better than everybody else. And if I don't put in the work, and if I don't know how to time myself to be able to put in the work, 
to prove that I'm better than everybody else. Nobody cares what I have to say. Nobody cares if I can do it really fast. They want it done really well. So that was a big lesson that I probably, actually definitely the biggest lesson that I learned. Uh, I love that. Yeah. It's everything that you do is exactly, everything you put in is exactly what you're going to get out of your experience. Mm -hmm. Um, looking back at Joe when he first started the program versus Joe today, what would you say is the biggest difference you see in yourself? Um, I am a, this is sort of a funny sentence, but I, th I hope that I'm a lot more humble than I used to be. I feel like I am. My writing used to be very sanctimonious and sort of not very nice sometimes. Basically, I, I think I've grown a lot personally in the sense that I understand my abilities um, and I understand what it really takes to be great at something because of Praxis instead of just good at something, which is what school was teaching me. Um, and I met some really, really talented people in the program that just blew me away. And they were so self-deprecating. I was like, how... like. I don't even know, I don't know anything about building a website besides like three HTML codes and you have built this beautiful, this like masterpiece of web design and you're telling us that it's not very good. Um, so it's sort of, that sort of brought things into perspective for me. But also I am better organized. I have better time management skills. I am not anywhere close to perfect because it's a very large hole I would have to dig myself out of. But if I hadn't, gone through praxis and I had just stuck with college and been like, I'll figure it out later. I don't think I ever would have figured it out. Mm. I, that, and that is, I'm not just saying that. I think that is the biggest thing I got out of praxis. It's like, Hey, you need to manage yourself properly or else you're going to not be able to keep a job or get one. <laughs> I love that too. Um, okay. So let's fast forward a little bit. You go through the placement process at Praxis, which, as you know, is very different than probably anything you'd ever experienced before job hunt wise. Mm -hmm. What was that process like for you and what were the results that you ended up with? So placement was a lot of fun and very exhausting. We were doing, I don't know if you still do this, but we were doing five pitches a week, um, which I put a lot of time and effort into those. So my time management skills really were honed during that time because it was just, you know, you had to pump them out. Um, I had quite a few interviews. I had a couple of job offers, but I wasn't, I didn't take them because they didn't feel right. And then apropos of nothing, um, one of the Praxis staff sent me an email and said, hey, this company, Marginal Revolution University, is interested in your profile. And I had never heard of this place. I had never made them a pitch. I had never done anything. So I was sort of surprised. And then I started reading about them and it was sort of, it seemed to be everything I wanted to do. It was a marketing job. I wanted to do marketing. It was in Washington, DC. Um, I wanted to live in DC. I love, I love this city. Even when everything is closed, it's still really nice. Um, it was with an organization that the more I learned about them, the more I loved them. I loved the mission. I liked everybody on the team seemed really cool. And so I was excited about this and I got the ball rolling and I was introduced to the manager. It's a very small team. There's only six of us. So the hiring manager is the manager and everybody else is on the hiring team too. So I was introduced to everybody. And so th that process was actually, I had, um, seven interviews with MRU. I had three phone ones and then they flew me in and I had four in-person ones with various groups of people. Um, and then I had to do what ended up being 20 pages, a homework assignment, which was basically like testing. So the, my favorite part of it was, uh, please proofread this email at the bottom tell us the name of your favorite band. And it was like a clever attention to detail test. And I really liked that. So I did all of that. Um, the last time I saw everybody before I got my decision, we were at a happy hour after all of my interviews, we just went out to a bar and I was like, this is really cool. And they were really excited about me and I was really excited about them. So um, the whole process took about a month and I was hired. 
And I've been there since I think July 29th, 2019. So I just now passed a year and it's a really fun job. It's a ton of work because there's so few of us, but it's really rewarding. Um, especially nowadays that people are looking, we're an online education company. So people are looking for resources to teach and, uh, we're sort of providing that. And so that's been really nice, but we also, we just make a bunch of different YouTube videos. So I get to run like a YouTube channel. I don't know. It's really fun. <laughs> it does. It sounds smart, great and really fun. Um, what are some of the top skills you've learned there? You know, obviously you were stepping into a marketing position without formal marketing experience previous <laughs> to that. What were your confidence levels like and how did you just kind of navigate navigate that the transition? <laughs> so my I don't remember what my confidence level was. I generally defer to expertise when I'm doing things. So I was probably like, huh, I wonder how I'm gonna do. This seems really fast paced, and there's only five at that time I think there were five people on the team. So I was like, what the heck did I just get myself into? But it was an excited, what the heck did I just get myself into? Not a terrified one, maybe a little bit. Um, so the biggest skills that I've learned are, I repeat myself, time management. Well, I thought Praxis was intense. MRU is like nonstop. Um, you have to have something in all the time. Like something's always due. We're always releasing an email or releasing a video. And there's all these moving parts and there's so few of us. That's an advantage because we're really nimble, but it's also like there's only so much, like there's only so much that one person can do at one time. So you really need to know how to prioritize. You need to know how to structure your days. Um, so that's, pro that's the biggest thing is just knowing how to project manage myself. And like I have 15 things that I have to do. But when is this due? How much work is it going to take? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's a big thing. And of course, you know, you get the requisite, like I know how to use different email clients now and I know how to use Salesforce and interpret these data that have to do with click rates. And I know search engine optimization and I understand how to use YouTube recommendations, whatever. Um, so it's a lot of stuff. But again, the biggest is the time management, project management. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially when you just have that many things in a really mm -hmm. small team. Yeah. Um, it's pretty noticeable if something doesn't get turned in. Um, aside from time management, like new marketing tips, tricks, techniques, um, just overall, you know, combining your practice experience, the apprenticeship with MRU, and then now your full-time job with them, like what is just the biggest thing that you've learned either about yourself or just what you're capable of in general? Like, what are you most proud of now, looking back on this past, I guess, year and a half of your journey? I think I'm, I'm proud of myself that I was able to get the job and keep the job. Um, I was not sure going into the end of my apprenticeship whether I was gonna keep it or not. I had made a couple of mistakes, one which was pretty major. Um, and I did what I could to mitigate that. I, I owned up to it immediately. I was like, hey, I messed this up. But still, I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm performing up to expectations. I don't know if they're going to keep me. And I just did my best. I kept doing what I was doing. Uh, I made sure to go out of my way to put in a little extra effort. Um, and it paid off. And I was really like, I was expecting, especially after the last mistake that I made, I was like, okay, well, that was really bad. They're probably not going to want to keep me and that's okay. Like I totally get it. But I think the energy that I showed and my willingness to sort of accept my mistakes and learn from them uh, went a long way in my favor. And also just the fact that I was passionate about like, Hey, we're trying to get, we want our mission. Our mission is to teach everybody economics basically we want to be in every classroom and people are learning economics for free we have like a thousand videos whatever and i'm like okay i want to help with that mission i'm not just here i'm not just along for the ride and i think just that energy and that effort was really helpful even if i did mess something up or i didn't have the experience seeing that passion is sort of what pushed me over the edge so i'm proud of myself for being able to sort of channel that energy 
into success instead of sorting sort of just sitting with it and being like i'm really excited about this but i don't know what to do with this excitement <laughs> absolutely and that is something to to really be proud of um which ways would you say that praxis best supported and helped you in this like major transition into a career and role like this i mean it was helpful just to have somebody who understood what i was doing because like my family didn't really understand what I was doing. The team actually understood pretty well. They had somebody else from Praxis was there for a while, so that was helpful. Um, but it was still, like, weird because I work with a couple of econ PhDs, and then there's me who has no degree and basically just waltzed onto the scene and was like, hey, I'm the new marketing person. I've never done anything like this before. Happy to be here. Um, so it was nice to have that support outside of the team that was like, hey, uh, I know that maybe you're discouraged or this is really hard or maybe you're doing well and we just want to talk about how well you're doing. Um, so it was nice to have those weekly check-ins just to sort of touch base and keep perspective on whether it was a, a big win or, or not. It was good to have somebody there that was like, let's talk about it let's think about it in context and let's see what we can do to build from this. And they like knew everything about where I was coming from. Yeah, for sure. I feel like anybody who's new in the professional world, if they had a personal coach or advisor for like their very first six months, it would make a world of a difference. Yep. <laughs> nice. All right. My last question for you would be if you were to give advice, to either your younger self, or if you want to imagine somebody who was in kind of a similar mindset or shoes as you, um, let's say like a year and a half ago, what would you say to them if they were kind of hemming on the decision to apply to the program? I don't want anybody to do something they think is wrong for them. My advice is to lay your options out on the table and try as best you can to examine them with an unbiased mindset. And so free from bias of I'm excited about this thing and I'm not excited about this thing. I don't like this part of this thing and I really like this part of this thing. Or everybody wants me to do this thing and nobody wants me to do this thing. Just cut all of that out and just look at it from a pros and cons what's good, what's bad. And that like, that's what I did. That's what I do. I try to think about things without any bias. Basically all this boils down to is eliminate bias in your thinking and your life will be a lot easier. Whether that's evaluating whether you should go to college or not, evaluating uh, whether you should take a job or not, or just like, Hey, should I have that extra like half pound of French fries at Red Robin or should I not? Like it really uh, goes a long way. If you think about the bias inherent in your thinking. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And I'm really looking forward to chatting with you soon and hearing how you're doing. Thanks for having me, Juliana. This was fun.